week's program. This week we're going to be talking about a variety of things, including flux meters and why fire are taking a very, very good interest in those. Also looking at the vegetable market and the wool season in retrospect. How good was it or how bad was it? And looking forward with a bit of positivity. But just a moment or two, it's farm accounting. with and without, it's a bit of a complex. Yeah, so you know, with winter on us, um, a lot of people get a bit gloomy, so they start thinking about the, uh, what happens when they reach the end of their life. Um, and it's shown that 5% of New Zealanders actually have no will. So That's they, pretty silly. Yeah, if they drop there without a will, um, it's going to involve the court applications and it gets really, really messy. Um, all those things that you intended never happen. Um, there's some certain pieces of legislation that just kick in and it gets distributed based on that. So you know, if you've got a spouse, they get everything. Um, if you've got kids, they'll get a basically two thirds of your estate. Their spouse gets the rest, plus a certain amount of money. Um, you may not have intended it that way, uh, but that's what happens if you have no will. Now yeah, the other thing is that court intervention. There's, there's a, an amazing story of a guy who left everything to two sheepdogs, and it, it caused a bit of a ruckus, really. <laughs> yeah, it would, because um, things like the Family Protection Act are there to make sure that you can't do that. Um, you've got to take into account who, what your family is and provide for them. Uh, and the courts would overrule that sort of thing pretty quick. Um, I've even seen instances where you know, one child's been favoured over the other two and the court has said, no, no, that's not on, and distributed it in a, in a different way to what the world actually said. So it's with, with the farming world, it, it's a wee bit complicated because a person can be left to run the farm. Yes. And it will and in a trust, in a company, yep. ooh, Gary. Yeah, and that's why you've got to get your succession plan in place and make the other family members aware of what's going on. Um, you know, if someone's going to take over that farm, then you need to make sure that other family members get other assets. So, you know, it could be that there could be a lump of money that's left to them instead of a, a part of the farm. Is there still, and I trust the answer is, is no, is there still an area in, in some people's minds where a daughter gets married off, so then for it's the husband's responsibility. There is some of that still going on, um, and you just can't make that assumption anymore. You've got to provide for that that daughter. Um, the level of it, obviously, you can discuss it with them, and if they know up front, um, then that's key. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you've gone and said to someone, "Look, when I die, I'm going to give you such and such," um, and it's not in your will, they have got, got legal rights to challenge your will, because if you've been telling them for years that you're going to leave them a certain asset or a lump of money. Um, they can say to the courts, well, look, this is what I was promised, I didn't get it, and the courts could go down that path and actually give them something. Ooh, that's a dicey one because that's... Uh, yes. that <laughs> <laughs> it's one where you know, people might, you might do something for somebody, it's worth a fair bit, and you go, oh, look, don't worry about paying, I'll, and they go, oh, when I die, I'll give you such and such. Um, if you forget about it, um, and that other person doesn't, and you die, and they're not named in that will, then they could kick up a stink, especially if it's high value. But that person who is saying that, that I, I'm, I promised you the race car. Yep. Um, it's their word against the co Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, but generally, you know, uh, there'll be someone that will know, someone else will know that it has been said. Oh, okay. Um, especially it's been done over a number of years. Um, there will be some general knowledge out there. Um, obviously, the other people involved with the will may not want it to come out, but you know, if, if for a court where you've got to. You've got to say exactly what you know. So, somebody comes to you as a chartered accountant and starts talking about succession. You've also got companies, so therefore you've got shares and you've got trusts. Yes. How does that all tie in? Because it's three different things. Yeah. So, if if you're a farm, normally the land will be owned in a trust or a company, um, and the operations and well, should now be done by a farm by a company because of the legal liabilities that are out there. If you're doing it other than a company, then the question needs to be asked why. It gets a bit easier because then you're only dealing with shares in a company, you're not transferring actual you know, plant and machinery and land, etc. Uh, and with a trust well, it, it carries on until the trustees decide what they want to do with it. Um, if your will says, you know, the, the land I want to give to son A, but the trust actually owns it, well then it's irrelevant. Your will has no impact on that, that trust. So you as a chartered accountant and a lawyer would work together yep. and, and, and unravel all Yeah, that. so you'd sit down with your banker as well. So your chartered accountant and lawyer would be involved. A banker would be behind the scenes because you make sure your finances are all sort of lined up as to how they should be. So if something does happen, that handover to the next generation or somebody else is pretty straightforward. 
but a lawyer and accountant need to work very closely together to get that will and the trust and the structure right. And probably an insurance broker. Yes, they come in after, after the fact once the structure's in place and you say, right, this is what we've got, how do we protect it, and what do we need to do to make sure it's effective for everybody. Hmm. What other factors will, do we need to consider when we're looking at succession? Uh, just, is there actually anyone available? You know, everyone makes the assumption, oh, I've got somebody that's going to take over my farm, but when you sit down with the family, none of them want to do it sometimes. We've got that situation at the moment where we've got a farmer, he's in his 80s, he wants to hand the farm off to his son, but the son's like, oh, I've got no interest in it, I'm not going to make any money out of it. <coughs> I, can well, go, I can go and work it <laughs> elsewhere, and he said, in fact, put the money in the bank, I can make more. Um, so, <laughs> Which is a bit sad, really, Kerry. <laughs> yeah, it is. But the, it's hard for the, for the <coughs> farmer to actually let go of, of the fact that no one's going to take over that farm. He thinks in his mind that the son will change his mind right up to the, the moment he dies, basically, and take over the farm. He's got no intention. So it's a, it's a tough one for some generations to accept that there is no one out, actually out there. And the only option is to put it on the market. But after the person has passed away? Yes. Invariably. Yeah, it's going to be that case in this situation because he's just not going to move. The son's not going to move. So, um, But you know, other parties, they might be able to come to agreement and say, look, you know, we know we're not going to take over the farm. You can stay, you know, the father might want to farm it for so many years or the mother and then put it on the market, sell it, you know, have some cash to live on for a while and then they just pass that on to the next generation instead. And then you've got the little bits where, for example, if you get married, the, the current will is not on void. Yes, so the will needs to be checked every so often. So a minimum of two years if there's been no changes within your family or your relationships. Um, if you change your relationship, then get straight into the lawyer and get it sorted. Um, <laughs> you don't want to muck around with an old will and you know, one party being named after another and etc. Exceed. Well, thank you for unravelling. You're very good at that, Kerry. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Just a moment or two, speaking of stress, we're going to be talking to a person who knows exactly what you should do and how to get rid of it. Carl, stress can cause a whole lot of different problems. Absolutely. Um, I'm a chiropractor. I do a lot with back pain and, and upper back pain and neck pain. And those are the, the ones that I see all the time come in where it's just structural body aches that are caused by it. But you can get any types of uh, ailment that are caused by stress. Um, middle ear issues. I had a person last week who um, had been through all of the gamut of tests, CT scans, x-rays, MRIs, trying to figure out what was going on, why they were unable to get up and, and they, were, they were sick. And they got no answers from the traditional route. Um, came in here, um, worked on them. First day, they were they were helped in. They walked out without any issues, um, and that was just uh, one visit, just to, because so much stress was on them when, when someone had passed in their family, and so those stressors where there's a big event and then you have a, a, a sickness along with that at the same time is almost always going to be a stress-related thing. So it was totally emotional. Yep, absolutely emotional. And our emotional and structural body have a lot of connections as well as you know, other things that you might not link to it. You know, a cold or a flu um, could easily be linked to it as well. Um, the low back pain, as I had mentioned earlier. All these things are interlinked because they're all part of your body. Does the body ever say, hey, listen, I'm just going to give you some real pain so that I can have a rest? That's exactly what it is. Um, what we do in this modern world is we keep pushing ourselves and pushing and pushing and pushing. And we just uh, take coffee, we take aspirin, we just medicate and get through it or we give ourselves coffee or energy drinks to get through it. Eventually there's a point where the body says, you're not going to do it anymore. You're going to listen and you're going to listen because you're going to be laying in bed unable to move. Or you're going to be laying passed out because you're, you had to fall down because the body just couldn't take anymore. And if you don't listen to the body, it will make you listen eventually. So you as a chiropractor, should we yeah. come and get regular checkups? I mean, for goodness sake, we take a car and do, do, do so, don't we? Absolutely. If you, if you value your body more than you do your car, it would be, it would be a good idea to look after the body. Um, we oftentimes do uh, maintenance checks three monthly about is what we can keep people going at pretty well. And with that, um, you keep the structural body in line and you also try and get rid of some of that stress and any, any other things that are going on in the body. The adjustments are a good way to release that because of our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. They're parts that kind of make us have that fight or flight response. Um, and there's also the rest and, re rest and relax response, which is the other side of that. And it's really important to keep those balanced. And if you're too, too stressed out, um, always thinking about what needs to be done next out on the farm, trying to think about what crops need to come 
come in or how the animals are doing, you're going to be in that uh, sympathetic response, the fight or flight, always on edge. And you do that too long, your body gets run down, you get run down, you start getting the aches in the back, you start getting overly stressed and you can't sleep. That's another really common one. And when you start not sleeping, that's when those other injuries are going to really build and compound and become even worse than they would have been otherwise. There's those who would say, no one's going anywhere near my back because I've had back operations and no one's going to start doing any more damage in there. All the time. <laughs> and another thing you hear with that is, I had a back operation and the pain's still there. Um, that, those are two things that you hear quite a lot, that you're not going near it and the pain's still there anyways. And, um, and, and the technique that I do and that several chiropractors will do out there is that you, you're, you're a bit more gentle than they typically think. They always think of wrenching and cracking and twisting on all these bits. And I would possibly agree you don't want to overly twist that, that low back surgery um, a lot. So you just got to find the cause of the pain. And it's not necessarily that you need that back twisted. It might be that there's something referring from an emotional cause that has tightened that back up over the years, or there's a food that's irritating the lining of your gut, and that's causing the back pain. So you have to find the cause for the pain and then take care of that. And it's, it's rarely ever, unless you've been hit by a car or didn't have your parachute open when you jumped out of a plane or something of that nature, it's rarely ever the simple structural answer that's the problem. So you're finding the cause, not the symptom. Exactly, exactly. And that's where chiropractic work is really good, especially the type that we do here, um, is you're, you're finding the cause of the issue. You're not uh, masking it with drugs and um, uh, the same adjustment all the time. You're trying to figure out what's causing it, adjusting it, and telling that person how they can help themselves with that stressor, with that cause. So people pull a muscle and they actually don't put that down to the fact that they're stressed. Absolutely. Well, muscles are essentially rubber bands that can contract um, and, and, and expand. And so what we have to do is figure out what's causing that muscle to be the issue. Because um, you wouldn't think that if you have a, a rubber band gun or something that breaks, it wouldn't be the rubber band having some issue. It's because there's something wrong that's tightened it up or made it loosen up too much. And if it's tightened up, it's usually some sort of stress that makes you tight, just like if you grind your teeth or clench your teeth under stress, that's gonna be part of the reasoning that it happens. So the answer is, come and see a chiropractor. Come, come, come and see a chiropractor, come and see somebody who addresses what's causing it. Um, if, you, if you had, if you have a bad diet, there's gonna be something in the diet. If you have a very stressful life, it's gonna be something in your stressful life. The, trick is pinpointing exactly what it is and managing those exact causes and then maintaining you in, in better health. So you look at a farmer who's got high mortgage rates and low prices, they're a dead sort of stress. Exactly, but they have to address that and in our routine is how we address that. So you, that, that mortgage rate isn't going to go away, the other stressors aren't going to go away, that's part of our modern life. We have to manage that with our routine, going to bed at a good hour waking up at a good hour, uh, not having too much coffee and too much other stimulants that are going to be pushing us too hard, um, dealing with the feelings that that stress causes. When you're not feeling like you're making enough to pay off the, the, the mortgage and the water's coming up over your head and you just can't deal with it right now, get that out of your system. Don't hold on to it, build it up and have to be the, the tough one to, to, to not let anybody see it. Um, expressing that and letting people help you is how you get on top of that and how you keep yourself above the water and, and succeeding and still going to work and getting those mortgage payments paid. You really just can't convince yourself though, can you? No, you, 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 need, to, you need to keep working at it. This, it's an everyday thing. You can't get over it. You can't convince yourself it's not an issue and then it's just done. You need to be worked at every single day. And you need to build into your routine, exercise, uh, eating right, having good things that can get you away from it, taking vacations every once in a while. Carl, when you treat somebody, do you suggest that their partners come in with them? Absolutely, absolutely, because they're both dealing with it. Um, the, the, the wife is going to be the support a lot of the time and going to be there in the background and they need to know what's going on and they're going to have stress too on the side of it as um, they're worried about the partner. And so they're both equally important to treat and there's going to be a lot going on in that family that needs to be, be addressed to help support them. Serial diseases. Now you're, not, you're, you're going to bamboozle me, aren't you? Not really, Rob. I'll try and put it in layman's terms as best that I know it. Anyway, <laughs> Rob, um, 
an exciting thing that came out of the FAR conference was uh, a machine they've got in Australia called a mic. And uh, I think it could be the precursor to a lot of other mics about the place. But basically this, this machine, in terms of um, serial diseases, can, you can take it out to the back of the, in, into the field in the back of your station wagon and feed in some uh, leaves with some disease on it, um, whether it be um, rust or mildew or um, scrotiny or all sorts of things. Um, whatever you've got, um, put it in there and this machine will analyse the, the pathogens that are in, in that infection and tell you whether they are um, susceptible or resistant to some of the common um, fungicides that we're using. You're kidding me. No, I'm not. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is that what they've found is that uh, even on the same property, in, in different fields on the same property, some of the pathogens have different sensitivities to different fungicides. So, you know, the days of going and buying a season supply of, um, of fungicide because you can get a ham or something like <laughs> that yes. are gone, basically. And, and we're going to introduce a lot of um, science into analysing and, and using um, some of these chemicals. And also, at the moment, there's a big amount of um, concern over herbicide-resistant uh, uh, weeds as well, So, and indeed uh, insecticide-resistant uh, insects. So that hopefully, this is a precursor to, to being able to analyse those sorts of things and say, well, OK, your weapon of choice today is this, this and this, or not that, because we have uh, analysed your insects, weeds or fungi, telling you that uh, you're wasting your time and money using that one, and, and really bring some science into the whole game. So how available are these mics? I think it's pretty uh, early days. Early days, but but exciting days, and obviously you can see uh, people wanting to develop that type of thing and people wanting to uh, employ that type of thing, and you can see a um, a real business um, emulating from that. And of course, you know the more targeted and the more scientific we can get with with uh, these pesticides and things we're using, um, the better the planet will be. And less complicated than the land descriptions that have been coming out. Yes, Rob. Um, yes, there's some wonderful new uh, land descriptions from Landcare Research, um, which, you know, things like Ricketon soil, and, and some farms are saying, well, never heard of that one before. I wonder what one that one's replacing. And we're thinking, well, maybe it should be Fendalton because it could make our farms more valuable. Well, that's a thought. Absolutely. But why would you want to change the names of soil types? No idea. No idea. But it's, it's uh, created a lot of confusion. It's been a uh, PR disaster in terms of the people who need to know their so soils and understand them, the, the, the poor values, the, the um, all sorts of values that, that soils have, hence giving them a name and a type, um, are completely lost amongst a lot of the people who either own them or, or need to use that information. And, and indeed, in the North Island, there's... there's um, South Island names like Ashburton for, for soils in the North Island and they used to be known as something else and it's really thrown the industry into confusion and, and I'm afraid Landcare Research and I think the government put some funding in behind that have stopped short of, of doing a PR exercise to the people that count. I believe it is on some website but farmers like to remain farming, not spend all their time in front of a screen like some other people are paid to do. Real estate agents will be a bit confused as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, how do you how do you attain a or put a value around something that you knew as, um, you know, Paparoa or, or Templeton's or something like that? They they spoke volumes just in mentioning their names because everybody knew that what type of soil it was, bit of variation underneath them in terms of whether it's clay or whether it's stony or or sandy, but that's about it. You could buy a farm on a, on a soil map. Biosecurity, what's the latest on that? Well, the fact, Rob, that uh, we're under pressure um, from importing um, all sorts of bad things, weed seeds and uh, undesirable things, and really the, the, the request is going out to all those people in the know, all those people who um, can observe something different or something changed, changing, to get hold of biosecurity and alert them to something different. You know, we've seen the old velvet leaf and I believe it was, was in the country probably about two years before it was ever highlighted, black grass, things like that. These are potential um, um, really, really damaging 
uh, incursions into our environment that uh, we need to um, be aware of and, and report to biosecurity. And you know, a magnetic um, phone number on the fridge is the way to go. Right. Spreading of Lyme. Yes, Rob, there's been quite a bit of work done recently on um, closely analysing, say, a particular field on a particular soil type and going in and doing lots and lots and lots of um, pH testing across, across the board and then trying to fix it with variable rate applications of lime. And the answer has been a lemon. It's been a disaster. Um, there is definitely lots and lots of different <coughs> pH levels across a field and it can be things like uh, different round troughs or it can be every, every swath of the uh, lime sower that's uh, put on lime in the past runs the same track. And of course the ballistic aspects of lime are quite different. You have your large particles and your powder. And there's no way that you can actually spread that evenly across the spectrum, especially if you keep running the same tracks that the, the fertilizer and, and lime sowers do every time they come in every five years or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so all they're doing is, is putting the, the course and the fines in the same place. So there's a real, real um, option out there to, to uh, if you're going to look at variable rate application, you need something that behaves absolutely evenly ballistically through the year so that you can get a, um, a guaranteed spread. So you're talking pellets? Talking pelletizing. Pelletizing lime. It doesn't sound too bad, it doesn't sound too hard. They can grind it up to powder, so why can't they push it back into an even pellet um, to hold its shape and its, and its weight and be spread evenly? It seems simple. <laughs> and it probably is, Dennis. Thank you very much indeed. Just a moment or two, we're going to be talking about flux meters and what they do and why far are backing them. Foundation for Arable Research now doing things with flux. What, what actually are you doing? The flux meters. Okay, so the flux meter project is a cross-sector, cross-region project where we're collecting information about nutrient losses from cropping systems. So what's the history of it? Um, it started with a conversation in my office between Hawke's Bay Regional Council and myself, and they came along and they said, we know where there are a lot of flux meters lying around not being used. And they had belonged to Ravenstown and they'd had them made for a project that they were going to do on DCDs. And the DCD big bubble broke, which was that, that whole dairy thing. And so they didn't do that project. And they had something like 136 flux meters sitting there with no job to do. So we started to put our heads into thinking mode. And we thought, there is no information about n nutrient losses from cropping systems. We need to know what's going on. So we built a project to just to do that. And Ravenstown were very generous and they said, take the flux meters and use them. So that's how it came about. Who else is involved? Okay, so we've got, because it's cropping systems, we're not just thinking arable crops, we're talking about vegetable crops and we're talking about forage crops and stock in the system. So FAR and Hort New Zealand and uh, the industry bodies along with Ravenstown. And we're in three regions, so we're in Canterbury and Hawke's Bay and the Manawatu and those three regional councils are also involved so Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Horizons, Environment, Canterbury and Plant and Food are our science providers and our technical providers so it's a big collaborative group. So how does it work? How does the flux meter work? Okay, a flux meter is essentially a long skinny bucket that's all it does, it's collect collecting drainage water and as you can see it's just made out of like plumbing equipment. <laughs> it has a, a wick in the top here and they are buried in the ground. The top of the um, flux meter sit sits a metre below the surface so they are, are way down below any of the working area that the farmer's going to do above them. And once they're in the ground, they're there forever. Um, we've got these tubes that come up to the surface, which is how they collect the drainage 
water out of them. So um, plant and food run a kind of water balance model so we know when drainage is happening and when we have a drainage event they come out to the paddock and they pump out the drainage uh, water that's collected in our long skinny bucket, our flux meter, and they measure the volume and then we, we take a, um, a small sample to measure the nutrient concentration. And we're looking at two nutrients, we're looking at nitrogen and phosphorus. On a practical system, you are looking at a practical use as far as farmers are concerned? Um, this is important information because of all the new regional rules that are coming in around um, water quality. So it relates to the regional councils being able to deliver their, their obligations under the National Policy, Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. And we need to know what volume or what amount, how much nutrients are being lost from farming systems. So as a farmer, they can see whether they're under fertilising or over fertilising? Uh, yes, that's correct. As a farmer, once we get these um, nutrient um, concentrations in the drainage water, we can then look at the system and, and see, get a bit of an idea about what's going on on top. So we're collecting a lot of information about what's going on at the, on the top as well. So obviously this, at this stage it's research, but there is a, in the future a very practical situation? Um, the practical part of the um, program is to start to use the information that we're collecting to work out whether we're a good or a bad or an ugly system and then go back to the farmers and say well we can see that you're losing nutrients at this part of the rotation and um, then we can sit down with them and start to look at their management practices on the farm and maybe improve them or, or we can yeah, try and make some changes. But there are a lot of bits of the system that they can't change, so things like soil type and climate come into play as well. I was going to ask you about <laughs> that, because obviously you're spreading around the country to get those different yeah. soil types. Yes, yes. So we've got a range of soil types and a range of climates. So we again, we go from the difficult to manage soils. So we've got some stony soils in Canterbury, which are quite free draining. We've got in the Manawatu a very light sandy soil which is also free draining. So those are the more difficult ones to manage as far as nutrient movements um, down to some of the deeper silt loams like that we've got on this farm. So range of soils, range of climates and the, the um, long term future of this project is to run it over maybe seven years so we've got a range of different seasons. It's becoming vital now because of the, the new rules and regulations and land use concerns. That's correct, yes. Farmers are going to have to take responsibility for nutrients leaving their farm. And they're going to have to demonstrate that they're using good management practices to reduce that risk. That's why you're taking it on as research, so that people can learn and benefit from it. That's correct, yes. What's the future for the programme? Okay, so we finished the first three years of the program and that, is, as we said at the beginning, is a collaborative industry regional council group and it was funded from the MPI Sustainable Farming Fund program of work with contributions from industry and the councils, everybody's chipped in. And we are hoping to get another chunk of money <laughs> to keep this project going for another three to four years. So we were to Nathan Guy? Um, we, uh, we've applied actually to the ministry, uh, MFE, which is Ministry for the Environment Fund, Freshwater Improvement Fund, so different ministry. So we're very optimistic that they'll see the value of this project. The value is there. I mean, obviously the fact that so many yeah. organisations are working shoulder to shoulder with you yeah. means that it is vital. Yes. And there's a value, the value is in having a long-term data set of nutrient losses from uh, mixed systems. Um, and then they can use that information to actually validate some of the models, the farm systems models that are being used out there, models like Overseer, which the regional councils are using to 
get estimates of nutrient losses from cropping farms or from all farms. So this is an is important data set to validate whether or not Overseer is giving us reasonable information. Very important is access by the farmers to this information. Absolutely, yes. How do they do that? At the moment it's all reported and it, we, um, we report the results from each of the sites in, in, in the public media. week of weather it's <laughs> one extreme to the other yeah it is uh, I mean we, we're certainly in the depths of winter now aren't we we can just <coughs> tell by by the cold weather we've got I mean that, and that's pretty typical I mean July is always going to be a lot colder than May and June simply because of the lag we have in solar radiation compared to day length you know it runs about six to eight weeks behind day length so uh, you know, we're getting into the trough of, of having um, of solar radiation arriving, which is really the driver. I mean, even though it might be sunny, we've, we're still lacking in the, in the solar radiation. But certainly last week um, uh, in, in Canterbury was, was very welcome. It, it's been over two months really since we've had a significant uh, precipitation event. I mean, we got a bunch, we got a stack of rain in, in parts of Canterbury and, a, and, and some really nice snow on the ground, which the beauty about the snow is that it slowly melts and it all ends up going into the groundwater system. We won't see that in the groundwater system for probably two to three months. Um, it takes that long to a, get to the shallowest aquifer and b down to the aquifers that we that we take most of our water from, especially for irrigation. Uh, so somewhere around about that sort of 55, 40, 50, 45 to 55 millimetres across the plains. As you go a little further north, uh, it's not quite as much. Um, but um, it's it's all very welcome. But it, man, has it made it wet on the surface? Uh, really wet on the surface. But it's mud, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. just it's turned the top 200 millimetres to, to slush, really. Uh, so, um, but that's good. It will drain, and it will and it will have an effect on on, on the groundwater system eventually. Uh, places like uh, the Wider Wrapper and and Hawke's Bay, in particular, that we that we're familiar with as well. It is unbelievably wet. I was in Hawke's Bay uh, last week prior to, the, to them getting 150 or more millimetres of rain. And, the, and there was water lying around on the Heratonga Plains in places where you would expect it to drain away quite quickly. It's, you know, sort of get on these stony soils and you'd expect it to just disappear out of the system. Well, there was water lying in some of those paddocks. Drive past orchards and every little hollow had, had standing water in it, and well, they've got another 150 to 200 millimetres on top of that. So they, they certainly won't have any issues with um, groundwater. It will, um, it, will, it will certainly fill up their aquifers. Uh, it will be some time before they can get on the ground and do things, and in particularly where you've got a big onion growing area in particular in, in the Hawke's Bay. Uh, it's going to have a detrimental effect on those crops. Those crops that uh, were out there and up, which and there were some that were up uh, um, after last Wednesday, Thursday, they will um, they've probably still got water uh, in the furrows and probably up as far as the tops of the beds. So that is not good for some of those horticultural crops which are up and out of the ground. Because you can't win, can you? No, you can't. It's a it's a it's a cruel business to be in agriculture. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, we, you, and, and, we, and we appear to be dealing more and more these days with the extremes. It's either it never rains or it does rain and it never stops raining. Uh, and, and, you know, this big rain, particularly for places like Hawke's Bay, which they, and they got snow down in, in places really close to Napier. I mean, the guy I was talking to last week that farms about 10 minute, minutes from Napier Airport had 50 millimetres of snow on the ground. Well, that's not 10 minutes from the Napier Airport. It's not getting very high above sea level, and uh, he had 50 millimetres of snow on the ground. So it's very cold as well there, as well as being very wet, and that combination is, is something that a lot of plants just don't like to uh, endure. That you know, so They'll tolerate a few days of, of being really wet, uh, but wet and cold is, is sort of, for a lot of those plants, sort of an intolerable situation to be in. There's reports coming out now that even cumulars are going to be expensive because they're, they're rotting in the ground. Yeah, well, if you can't get on the ground to get things out, I mean, even if you drive around parts of Canterbury and 
and parts of the Hawke's Bay, for example, they've still got potato crops to get out of the ground. Uh, those main crops that are sitting there and have done quite nicely well, they will be uh, quite difficult to uh, get out of the ground and there will be a lot of soil attached to those potatoes when they come out of the ground now. Yep. So looking out, I mean normally you, you're, you're sort of saying we need rain. <laughs> yeah look, um, in, terms of, in terms of groundwater, in terms of recharging the Canterbury aquifer system, uh, you know 55 millimetres will help. Uh, we're still a long way short of getting our, our water levels back to what we would consider a, a satisfactory and safe level for the next irrigation season, uh, particularly north of the Rakaia River uh, and even more particular above the uh, north of the Selwyn River. So if you go south of those two rivers, uh, what we do have coming into those regions is alpine water. So water coming in in the irrigation schemes, we get a lot of leakage, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of areas in the upper parts of the plains that are, that are irrigated, and then when we, which means we have relatively small soil moisture deficits when we do start getting these large rainfalls and suddenly we get recharge. And those aquifers and those groundwater levels are in much better shape than if you come north of the Selwyn River and head into North Canterbury. So <clears throat> the future as far as Niwa are concerned, are they giving us any clues about what's coming down the tubes? Um, it's, 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 uh, it's pretty normal, you know. It's, it's not, it's <laughs> they not, love that it's, word, it's, don't they? It's <laughs> neither one nor the other, you know. There's a good chance that we're going to have about normal conditions. So does that mean we're going to get rainfall? Does it mean we're not going to get rainfall? And, and we are in a bit of a, if you look at it, we are in a bit of a, um, a, a hiatus as far as the weather is concerned. I mean, this is the, you know, if you look at what happened in, in, in Canterbury uh, in the last week, uh, it's the first time probably since 2013 or 2014 that we've had, we've had, a, we've had a, a reasonable amount of snow sitting on the ground on the plains. Uh, and so that could be a good sign that what, something else more is, it could come. You know, open up the gateway to the south again and give us another decent southerly or southeasterly and dump a pile of snow and rain? I don't know. Um, I, I think we're in a wait and see mode at the moment. And really, it's just a case of keeping up to date as far as your maintenance is concerned because it could be soon. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, you know, once we hit once we hit September, you know, we, we, we're not going to have any issues in August this year, that's for sure, and probably not until the first or second week of September. But once we get into that period, if we go through a period now without a lot of rainfall and we get into those spring-like conditions, then we need to think about things in the middle of September. Tony, thank you very much indeed. Continuing on about the story about uh, horticulture and vegetables, Robin Oakley is next. Robin, national media saying that the prices of vegetables are going up very substantially. Oh, it's wonderful, isn't it? You know, we're just going to make so much money this year. No, it's just the media having another good old go again, isn't it? They like to pick something out and, and make a big story of it, I suspect. I'd love to know whether they quote over a wide range of vegetable products and repeat the same thing again, or whether they just pick a few out that make the figures look very good. But the reality is the, 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 the same. The main culprits are uh, lettuce and broccoli are, are well featured there, and I think there's two or three other vegetables that are mentioned but you know there's there's a big range of vegetables in the stores not just those so I, I wonder where their figures have come from but you know lettuce and broccoli we've, we've had two big cyclones come through this last autumn and um, they have a big effect on crops and how they grow we've had a lot of wet weather I mean we've experienced a uh, reasonable amount of head rot through the broccoli so there's a lot of crop hasn't got harvested um, you know, you've seen on the news previously with lettuce crops and a lot of the leafy crops, the effect it's had on those. And when you're coming into the winter, you can't just quickly play catch up and replace any of that because you've got longer growing times and uh, the, the impact of that, that weather has a bigger effect than what it does if they say come in the spring or the summer, you'll get a much shorter window of, of the effect of the veg, you know, those products being short. But, uh, you know, that's vegetable growing. I think in this country we do a pretty darn good job in the fresh industry with, with how consistent we are with supply, quality and pricing for most of the time throughout the year in a country that's got quite a, you know, a big range of seasonal climatic variations um, from between summer and winter and your spring and your autumn and then, and then your geography up and down the country. So I think, you know, I've been around plenty of places, it's, it's, it's pretty well done here in New Zealand. It is supply and demand, isn't it? Yes, and, and it's actually good to see that the supply and demand model is still working because um, 
you know, those those high prices that you've seen in the in the stores, the majority of that is, is been passed on to the to the growers. So the, yes, the growers have got higher prices, but they've received higher prices on much lower volumes. And nine times out of ten, when you get a situation like this, the net profit back to the grower on that area of crop growing is always less. The increased price never makes up for the, the drop in production. It's interesting that the focus is not on the fact that you guys have lost a lot of money, it's on the fact that some people are paying a bit more. Yes, and I don't know, you know, there's not many growers out there so that wouldn't be newsworthy would it? It's more newsworthy how, how it's affected the majority but it's always interesting how they pick one or two people out and say well I can't afford to pay three ninety nine for the head of broccoli or the five dollars odd for lettuce. Well, you know, it's not compulsory to buy those things. There is always alternatives out there that people can be buying and, and that's a fact of life. Often they might like to compare it with a with a cup of coffee. That's always a good one. You know, people are happy to spend four or five dollars on a cup of coffee or what have you and you know they, they you know the value they perceive between that and, and some fresh produce but that, that's always going to be the way of it. But I think a lot of times fresh fresh produce is quite undervalued for most of it. You won't ask what a price for a packet of cigarettes is. No, well, a bit different. We haven't got people addicted to vegetables yet. That would be, that would be quite good, wouldn't it? Maybe we could uh, do some uh, price adjustments on the basis of that. Seriously, you guys have spent a lot of money promoting five per day. Is this going, is this going to knock that around? Well, it shouldn't do because anyone that's that knows what's good for them, you know, the price of petrol goes up. You don't. You know, you might think twice about doing a bit less running around or one thing or another, but your body still needs fuel. I mean, we, we, we need to eat, and one shouldn't, you know, I certainly won't be compromising my intake of fresh fruit and vegetables every day because a few items go up in price. I might decide, well, I'm going to have a bit more of this or something else, or uh, th there's always a lot of selection and range out there in fresh. And, and the other thing people have to remember is we're not dealing with processed products. They're not just coming out of a factory line somewhere and like I said earlier we do such a good job in this country of, of, of having consistency and quality and supply one could almost be forgiven for thinking that they're just coming out of a machine somewhere but they're not they're, they're growing out in, in real soil in the real environment you know you get up on a Saturday morning and you want to go and do your weekend sport and it's raining and it's cold and it's horrible and you're getting a bit annoyed because it's been like that for the last three weekends well hey the crops aren't enjoying it either you know it's not a lot of fun out there for them and it's not a lot of fun out there for the for the people growing them either but we, we still get out there and we get a result and, and get that product on the shelf and at times you know the quality is going to drop a bit it's the weather we're not magicians we can only work with it and we do the best we can and I think we do a pretty good job. And it is seasonal I mean lettuces this time of year are a bit of a luxury to be quite frank. Well e exactly I mean you, you got to get a bit of reality in the situation here and, and say well you know how many people in the home garden through through this time uh, are enjoying an abundance of good quality of, of, of the products that they're talking about. You know, it, you know, it can be a tricky time of the year to have them in the first place and when you get the, the weather events we've had it, uh, I think we just about need to be magicians to, to do what we are doing. season you're not really excited about it <laughs> it's been a season that I think um, people would prefer to forget in the industry and um, and I think that covers all sectors from growers right through to exporters you know you've got your you've got your obviously growers your merchants brokers exporters um, and I think I've mentioned before but it's interesting probably to recap what's actually happened. Um, mm. The value, the if you look at the strong will indicator, which measures probably 60 to 70 percent of our clip, it's probably retraced something in the order of $1.50 to $2 New Zealand cents a kilo over last season, which is a lot. And I think it took everybody by surprise, and the biggest surprise was the speed of it. And and the reasons are really there's there's two main reasons. The biggest one is that um, China's taking 20% less of New Zealand wool, and that wool really had nowhere to go. And um, I think we've discussed the reasons for it. There's been a swing to finer wools, like the merino and halfbred fine halfbred sectors doing very well. They've had a very good year. 
they want something softer um, and prepared to pay for it, basically. And a lot of the cross, the coarser type wools that were going in to make these fabrics that they were using in the past, they basically don't want them anymore. So there's, um, in China, the stocks of fabric, stocks of wool, um, and given the way that we're, the market works, it invariably all comes back in time to the physical market here. It took a while, but it certainly did. And um, so last season was a very difficult season because we had the market basically going down for 12 months. All it did was basically go down. And that makes things, from a business perspective, difficult because you have certain issues to deal with. Mm. But obviously the farmer, you know, has had a rough time as well. So anyway, we've just started a new season from July 1. And I think there's signs out there that um, it's not a price, the price has come down a lot, as I said, it's, but it's not price, it's demand. That's the issue, obviously, that we've had. And you can see now that New Zealand wool is very competitive now with, with its main competitor, really, if you're talking the carpet floor covering upholstery sector, which is UK wool. We're, we've come right back, in fact, and sometimes we're actually underneath them. Now, our feedback from the European customers is that at these, they're more than happy with the price level, and what I suspect is happening, and what they're actually saying to us as well, is that they're starting to re-blend with more New Zealand content in their yarns, in their collections, etc., etc. That will impact. That'll but be, that's a good impact. Though. That's a good impact. But it, it doesn't happen like that. It'll happen, I suspect, in five or six months' time, we'll be looking at a wee bit of a different scenario. What we want is stability and, some, and the market to come off these levels where it is now. Because if that happens, it breeds confidence and then you'll get more people c coming back and John, entering the, the market again. Is there a wool mountain? I mean, have we got this huge amount of wool that uh, nobody wants? Um, I wouldn't say mountain, but obviously we've had passings, um, quite high passings at times throughout last season. And that wool, a lot of that wool remains in the country. Mountain, I would say maybe around 20% of the actual total volume of the clip remains in New Zealand as we speak. And some of that wool is actually, the, you know, a lot of the growers and people in the industry have said, we'll hang on to it. You know, as the market last season, we'll hang on to it. And they can probably afford to, really, because wool's not what it used to be as far as a percentage of their income and all the rest of it. So a lot of them have held on to it. But some now, in the last few months, have actually started putting it back onto the market, which hasn't helped either. No. <laughs> right? So, but um, this season has actually, the first two sales have held up reasonably well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a difficult one, but you can't help but feel that um, we're at, we're getting to the levels now where we can actually recover. And the, just before you go, I said two factors, didn't I? And the <coughs> other factor is, of course, that uh, the impact of man-made fibres has been huge on wool and continues to be so. You know, you can talk about the Australasian carpet market, just Australia and New Zealand. You don't have to go back too far to um, see that wool as such had a probably a 70 to 75 percent market share in floor coverings and whatever. Now over the last 10 to 15 years that's um, gone back to probably like I would suspect around 20 percent and that's had a big impact. Man-made fibres, you know, your nylon, polypropylene, polyesters has had a big effect on wool. Um, so those two factors 
if you intertwine them, have certainly meant that the last, well, the man-made fibre ones has been ongoing for some time, obviously, but the impact of the Chinese thing has just, yeah, caused what we've seen. Do you think farmers will, will drop a type of sheep and chase what is selling? Well, you know, obviously a lot of them would go fine, you know, if they could, they'd go finer to take advantage, but that doesn't happen overnight with a breed. Uh, the reality is that a lot of cross, they, merino sheep do not survive on lower land country. I mean, <coughs> feet problems, water, moisture, and all that, the rest. They're hill country. They're hill country. And um, so, thank goodness meat has been, meat has held up there as far as income's concerned. Beef's been good. Other income streams outside wool have been okay for them, thank goodness. So um, I, my advice would be to stick with it. It's cyclical. Everything in farming is cyclical. Yeah, and not too long ago, it was exactly the opposite situation. Fine wool was having problems, and actually we were looking at 6 to $7 clean per kilo for the types, the very types of wool I'm talking about. That wasn't too long ago. So the swings and roundabouts, but we're going to. This is going to take a while to actually come right um, or come off these levels again. But I, my suggestion was stay in there, stick in there. We've seen it before, and um, yeah, we're on our front foot. You got to be on the front foot. John, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> now, if you'd like to go back over what John was saying, you can go to our website, which is on the land co.nz. I'm Rob Coke Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the programme, but I will be back at the same time next week looking at some of the stories that we've done, which I'm sure you'll enjoy watching again. Until then, bye now.